having heard my topics of interest, a lot of people know that I'm one of those advocates for Signum doing things other than Tolkien. So it's not lost on me the irony that I'm talking about Tolkien today. Um, a translator is not free. Uh, this comes from a line in one of Tolkien's letters to his aunt, uh, Jane Neve, when he's sort of complaining about the complexities of translating Pearl, uh, the Middle English poem, into modern English. Um, sort of implying that there are certain rules by which uh, translators are bound. Um, he doesn't, in that letter, go into what those rules might be. He's just sort of uh, complaining at that moment. But um, I think that uh, we can actually figure out a number of uh, the rules or the, or the guidelines, we should probably call them, um, that he went by, uh, not just in his work as an actual translator, you know, his, his academic work and doing translations like Beowulf and uh, Pearl and Sir Orfeo and those kind of things, but also in his uh, fictional work. Um, in fact, I, I kind of uh, take the tack that you can actually look at much of what Tolkien uh, did, um, certainly after college, um, probably before college and, and earlier on as well, um, as engaging in some aspect of translation or another. Um, he obviously uh, early on did a lot of lexicographical work. Um, his Kenya lexicon, uh, work on the OED, Middle English uh, vocabulary that he uh, created for Sissom's 14th century verse. Um, he did obviously a lot of uh, academic articles looking at specific words and passages in Old English and Middle English, um, Sigawara land, uh, the Reeves tale, Finsbridge fragment, those types of things. Um, he uh, did outright translations, as we know. Um, he did Beowulf. He uh, had a, an edition of Old English Exodus. Um, and again, the Sir Gawain, Pearl, and Sir Orfeo. Um, his fiction work has been described, um, and he describes it in a, a number of times as translations. Um, it's been described as analogous translation, uh, which um, Shippy calls it that in uh, The Road to Middle Earth, he, he says Tolkien was obliged to pretend to be a translator. Um, as time went on, he also felt obliged to stress the autonomy of Middle Earth, the fact that he was only translating analogously, not writing down names and places as they really had been, um, which is similar to something that Christopher Tolkien says in uh, The Peoples of Middle Earth, where he talks about um, his father converting the true languages of men and hobbits in the Third Age of Middle Earth into an analogical structure. And um, so what, that, what does that mean exactly? Well, it means we, we don't know the language that hobbits really spoke, right? Um, we, we, the, the hobbits, uh, he talks about in Appendix F, um, that they spoke, or, or sorry, in an early draft of what eventually became Appendix F, uh, that the hobbits spoke the language or languages very <coughs> similar to our own in manner and spirit. Um, <clears throat> but if the face of the world has changed greatly since those days, so is every detail of speech and even the letters and scripts then used to have long, uh, <clears throat> then used have long been forgotten, and so um, the same is true with the common speech and the Rohiric language and other languages. So when Tolkien is writing, he's writing, uh, translating these languages analogously. He's using, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon or a sort of modernized form of Anglo-Saxon for the Rohirrim, and um, English, you know, modern English for the common speech and that sort of thing. Except that we kind of do know some of those older languages because he gives them to us. In, for example, Appendix F, he says that Matham is meant to recall the ancient English Matham and so to represent the relationship of the actual Hobbit cast to Rohiric Castu. So it's like, okay, well, there's two words right there that we apparently got from the uh, actual Hobbit and the actual Rohiric. He gives some other examples in Appendix F. Um, Things like Smigel and Smile from the Rohir Trahan. Um, he talks about the consonants sort of between Smigel and Deagle and Trahold and Nahold. Um, uh, and there are a few other examples. Um, and so my question kind of became, what point do we have to get to where we have enough words and enough structure that we're no longer translating analogously and just, you know, translating? So for an example, I give you the case of Fatty Bulger from Bulgeford. Um, Throughout his work, obviously, we all know that Tolkien had uh, a number of drafts and versions of, uh, of, of, of you know, his writings, um, and Lord of the Rings specifically. Um, in Appendix F, he writes that personal names of the hobbits were also peculiar, and many had come down from ancient days. Um, the ancient days they came down from was this sort of proto rohiric language in the Upper Anduin that he mentions. Um, and if we look back at an early version of that, 
uh, what became the Appendix F um, and Appendix E uh, in Peoples of Middle Earth, we actually get a reference. Uh, he gives us actually a list of names uh, and sort of the etymology and, and significance of those names. Um, so when looking at the name Bolger, he says it's merely an anglicized form of the hobbit Bolgra, uh, by chance, if chance you call it. Uh, in, in the common speech, uh, Holg has much the same significance as our bulge. So that if Bolger suggests to a modern reader a certain fatness and rotundity, so did Bolgra in its own time and place. Um, so what you have here is you, you have a word that's presumably the actual hobbit word, um, which is being translated uh, into an English word that means very much the same thing. And, and it's not clear that he's really doing anything analogous right at this point. Um, that, of course, gets condensed down into Appendix E of Bolger has a G as in bulge. But I think he's kind of winking at us there. I think he's saying, yeah, there's a little semantic relationship there, right? Like, I, I'm just going to tell you that the Gs are the same, but, but maybe, uh, you, you know, we know what Fredegar looks like, um, at least until he's let out of lock holes and he's fatty no longer. Um, we also know that early on in, in the Fellowship of the Ring that Fatty's, fam uh, Fatty's family is said to come from the East Farthing, from Budgeford. Um, and when you look at the nomenclature of the Lord of the Rings, which is what Tolkien wrote for primary world translators of his own work, it says that budge was an obscured element, having at the time no clear meaning. It may, re may be regarded as a corruption of the element bulge or bulge. Both Bolger and Bolger occur as surnames in England. Whatever their real origin, they are used in the story to suggest that they were in origin nicknames referring to fatness and tubbiness. So what you have here is then Tolkien taking an actual Hobbit word, Bolgra, translating it as Bolger, which means bulger, someone who's bulging at the waist, you would imagine, and, uh, and applying that then to the real world translation and telling real world translators that that's the way that it needs to be translated. And so he's kind of bringing that in, making those primary world translators complicit in his rules for translation of the languages in The Hobbit and, and The Lord of the Rings. But I think he's taking that even a step further because I think those rules that he's using in The Lord of the Rings are actual real world rules that he grew up learning and using. Um, in uh, week five of the Shaping of Middle Earth talk uh, at Mythgard Academy, Corey uh, says that the more he reads Tolkien, the more convinced he becomes that from Tolkien's point of view, there was really a continuity and um, that there wasn't a, any kind of disjunction between his scholarship and his non-academic work. And that all of this was using the same part of his brain. And that's actually in the, the part where he's talking about Tolkien uh, translating the Quentin Old Renoir into Anglo-Saxon. <clears throat> and I think this can be seen over and over again. I think you can take that same analysis and look through the entire list of names in uh, The Peoples of Middle Earth and go through and see different ways that Tolkien kind of applied that, not just in his writings, but then in the translations that he required uh, real world translators to use. Um, so kind of jumping off of that, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the rules or guidelines or things that he talks about. Now, um, of course, when talking about translating, you can't help but talk about his uh, paper on translating Beowulf, right? Um, in that paper, he talks about old words, uh, specifically that you have to use old words when translating Beowulf because that's what the poet used when he was writing uh, the poem. He, he used words that were already old in their culture. If you wish to translate, not rewrite Beowulf, your language must be literary and traditional because the diction of Beowulf was poetical, archaic, artificial. But you can't word, use words that are too old <laughs> at the same time. Tolkien says the words chosen, however remote that they may be from colloquial speech or ephemeral suggestion, must be words that remain in literary use. They must mean, need no gloss. And so it's an interesting dichotomy there. I think the, the bigger principle that he's looking at, though, is, is you really need to look at what did the writer and what did the audience uh, expect at the time uh, you know, in the language of, of the thing that's being written, whether it's Beowulf or something else. And you, you have to apply yourself in that way. Um, it also brings up the really interesting question of what old words did even Tolkien think were obsolete? Like, <laughs> I mean, he knew a lot of old words, um, so it's kind of surprising that he might even think, but we get a couple examples. In um, Beowulf, uh, the translation and commentary, he talks about Kunin versus Witan in uh, 
uh, Anglo-Saxon, and I'm, I haven't studied Anglo-Saxon, so if I butcher the pronunciations, please forgive me. Um, he says, the distinction between Kuna became more and more limited to the sense of know how to do a thing, whence our can. Uh, while Gignawin recognized, slowly extended its sphere until in modern English it covers both Kunan and Witan, and Iwat, a form of Witan, has become obsolete. So there we go. We have Tolkien actually admitting there's a word that's too old even for him to use. Um, <laughs> what's really interesting is that I think, it, not that I think, but he states, um, so he wrote a draft of a letter, uh, I forget to who it was off the top of my head, uh, to someone who was complaining about the archaic language in the Two Towers. And basically, Tolkien says, oh, you want archaic language? I can give you archaic language. <laughs> um, so he takes a few lines. And one of the lines um, that he does is he says, uh, you do not know your own skill in healing. He says, if, if I really wanted to say it archaically, I would have said, nay, thou knowest not thine own skill in healing, using thou wast, which is also a form of baton. Um, so you have in two different places him saying, this, this is just a word that you, you just can't use when you're translating. And of course, uh, in the two towers there. That's, that's um, uh, being spoken by uh, uh, the king. Sorry, I'm blanking. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, which is based on Anglo-Saxon. And so you have the connection there with um, Beowulf as well. Looking through the um, translation and commentary of Beowulf, you can also find, I, I listed out a few other examples here. Ale quaffing, he changed to ale drinking at um, C.S. Lewis's suggestion. Um, now, Quaffing, is that too old? I mean, probably a lot of us know what that means. Um, you know, for a translation for a general audience, maybe he changed it. Um, it's interesting, actually, for his lay of Beowulf, which is a rewrite, not a translation. Um, he does use quaffing in there. Um, Fain, he changes to tabernacle. Undern tide, he changes to middle hours. So I think there's some examples there of him sort of applying this idea that he pre presents in his, uh, you know, on translating Beowulf and, and actually showing that he made those changes. And then we get to dwaros. Um, we all know that he chose dwarves over dwarfs, um, partly for the sound of it, partly because it seemed more accurate. Um, but he says, uh, I, this is to one of the unwins, I don't remember which. Uh, the real historical plural of dwarf, like the teeth of tooth, is dwaros. Rather a nice word, but a bit too archaic. Um, and then immediately he says, well, I still wish I kind of used it. Um, <laughs> which is, yeah, kind of funny. Um, in Peoples of Middle Earth, uh, in, again, in what became Appendix F later, but which got whittled down quite a bit, he said, I always had a love of the plurals that did not go according to the simplest rules. Loaves and elves and wolves and leaves and reeds and houses. Uh, and I persist in hooves and roves because, uh, according to ancient authority, I said, therefore, dwarves, however I may see a spelt, feeling that the good folk were a little dignified so. I wish I had known of dwaros in those days. Um, again, yeah, maybe he would have used that, but I think he still kind of would have rejected it ultimately, although obviously he goes on to use it in place names like Dwaro Dwelf, Dwaro, Dwaro Delf, and other names within the uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, nomenclature. So, as I mentioned before, he wrote this nomenclature of the Lord of the Rings to uh, instruct, inform uh, translators in the primary world. This happened after a few uh, translations went awry or, or were starting to go awry. Um, in particular, the Dutch translation, he had some very strong opinions on the proposed words that um, uh, you know, uh, the, the translator had uh, sent in uh, you know, for, for nomenclature in his uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, the word in particular, though, that he, he just would not stand to have translated was Hobbit. Uh, I will not tolerate any similar tinkering with the personal nomenclature, nor with the name word hobbit. I will, have, I will not have any more humpin, nor any hobble or whatnot, um, which uh, humpin was used previously in one point or another. Um, yeah, I, just, I think it's really interesting, again, that he's, he's applying these rules uh, you know, to the real world translators. But where is he coming up with these rules? Um, I don't think it's just that. He's like, I really like the word hobbit, and you just can't change it. It's a word I made up, or you know, kind of made up. And I, I don't think he's just saying, like, you can't use other words to translate my words. I think there's something deeper going on here. Um, going back to the Anglo-Saxon translations he made of the Quenta Noldorinwa, he has a list of translations of the um, Valar names and, and a few other names and words. Uh, that he provides Anglo-Saxon translations of. This I stole right out of um, <clears throat> this little chart I stole out of Corey's presentation. So you can tell him or not if uh, 
you want, but you know, he already knows. Um, but uh, in there, he, he, he actually, we, so we know that the elves were the ones who named the Valar, right? The Valar have no language, Tolkien reminds uh, someone in a letter or tells someone in a letter. Um, and uh, they didn't need one. They, they already knew who they all were. Like, they didn't need names for each other. Um, but the elves needed names. And so you get names like Manway, which um, means good guy, basically. Uh, blessed being, Tolkien says. But if, if you're confused as to who you're supposed to root for in the Silmarillion, good guy is a good <laughs> translation. Um, Manway and anyone he's associated with. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon, he translates Manway into Wolkenfreya which is uh, basically Sky Lord, Lord of the Sky. Um, and you can see that that's picking out a particular function or deed, um, as he says in his letter, uh, which is exactly what the elves were doing when they named uh, you, you know, the Valar. And so um, you can see that sort of Sky Lordness, the, the ruler of the skyness through all the different versions from the Lost Tales all the way through the later Quintus on the right. <clears throat> and uh, what actually is going on here, um, he actually, there's, there's a line in his paper on Sigilwara land where he's, he's talking about the, so Sigilwaran uh, translates Ethiopian, basically. Um, and he's like, there's a perfectly good word already in Anglo-Saxon for Ethiopian, it's Ethiopian. Um, and like, why, why are they using this other word to do it? And what does it mean? And where does it come from? And he says, classical or biblical proper names are not usually translated by a word having no obvious connection with the original. And so what I think he's doing is he's looking at the Quenya, the, what he refers to as the Elven Latin, uh, as a classical language. And so when he's applying his translation rules in his own writing, he's, he's not translating them. I mean, they do get translation, so you get Imladris in, into Rivendell and that kind of thing. So there's some analogous translation over there. But when he's saying to primary world translators, you can't translate Imladris, you can you know, maybe change the inflection, you know, for whatever language you have, for plurals and that kind of thing. But you can't translate in logics because it's a classical language. It's, it's the same kind of thing that, you know, the Anglo-Saxons didn't do most of the time, except for this one word. Um, and so I think he's really applying that in his own writing and then reapplying it again uh, in those uh, translations for the real world. Um, and then he had some stylistic rules. Uh, I mean, we, there's a lot you can say about style, different kind. He talks about repetition in on translating Beowulf. You can't necessarily take a word that's repeated in Anglo-Saxon and take another word that's repeated in modern English and have them mean the same thing, because there's just there's too much difference there, even though the repetition itself might be important. And so you have to figure out a, a different way to kind of apply that. Um, Kennings, obviously, very hard. You have to translate the picture in comparison that the Kennings is meant to evoke. Um, in talking about a specific Kenning, uh, Kenning in Beowulf, Hronrod, uh, which is often translated to Whale Road, uh, Tolkien says dolphin riding would be a better, uh, a, a better term. He says that etym etymology is not a safe guide to scent. You can't just take the etym etymological flow and then try to like backfill it in. Um, and then variation, uh, particularly with the sound, the phonostatic uh, version. Um, he talks about uh, in one letter, silver versus argent, and sort of the different poetical and, and uh, you know, aesthetic implications of those. So what does this all have to do with Sororphia? Well, obviously, he translated Sororphia, so that's one thing. Um, Tolkien actually had a lot of touch points with Sororphia. I mentioned the Middle English verse earlier. Um, Tolkien, uh, in there, he's uh, providing glossary for um, Sisson's 14th century verse. Uh, which includes uh, Sir Orfeo, and so there's a lot of words referring to there. Um, in 1944, he, uh, Tolkien created a Middle English version of his own for a uh, naval cadets course that he taught. Um, and you can go actually read that in Tolkien Studies 1. Um, and it's around that time that he probably also created his translation, which obviously wasn't published until 1975. Um, and then he also, uh, you know, oversaw Alan Bliss's work, which is, um, you know, for a long time now has been the definitive sort of, uh, you know, book that includes all the different Sorofio uh, manuscript versions. Um, Drought says that uh, because of Tolkien student, uh, because one of Tolkien's students, Alan Bliss, published what is now standard edition of Sorofio, it's likely that many of Tolkien's interpretations may have already entered into published scholarship. So, as my timer is going off, 
I'm just going to give you one example. Um, there's several other examples in the handouts. Um, and if, again, if you didn't get one, I can send you it. Um, so I'm going to actually look at the second example in there, the, the river forest with the flowers, um, which is the Middle English version that, tra that Tolkien translates into water and wild and woods and flowers. Um, I think this is a, a fairly obvious example, which is why I'm using it right now. Um, so rivers, forests, flowers, like easy to translate, right, from Middle English into Modern English. Frith, what is that? Well, in Middle English verse, our, our vocabulary, he says uh, it's a woodland or a park. But you can't use that and keep the alliteration of the forest frith with flowers, right? So he changes it. He changes it simply. Water and wild and woods and flowers. And I think you can see there he's just applying the sense and the, the style of the original uh, in the way that he talks about doing, in, in the way that in um, translating Beowulf and, and in other places that he, he says you need to retain the style of sense and uh, even when you're changing... Um, you know, the words or the order of the words and that kind of thing. Um, sorry I can't go into more, but I want to leave time for questions. So what questions does anyone have? Actually, the passage you were just discussing, the water and wild and woods and flowers, do you have any comment on the intrusion and in there? Because that changes the rhythm. Why do you think Tolkien might have done that? It's a good question. I have not thought about why he adds the and in there to answer your question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, throughout throughout the in in both the Middle English version that he creates for the Naval Cadets course and in the translation, I mean, he met, he, he he changes the meter I think a lot to kind of make it more regular. So that would be my guess. I had I did I was looking more at the alliteration there to be honest, but that would be my guess on top of that. Well, there's one speculation. What about um, putting the ends to so you don't get too many W's? Yeah, yeah. There's a good repetition there. Yeah, but it, it seems that he's he's um, mimicking the rhythm of the you know rivers, forests, frith with floors, water and wild and woods and flowers. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that seems why uh, there's been an extra hand. Because the 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 forest yeah, so has an extra right. beat to it. Right. The wild end. Sorry, go ahead. Not racing on that. The, the, capturing the meter, mm -hmm. um, alliteration would be an important criteria yeah. in something like the first translation of Sorokia. But in his translation of Beowulf, which is really a, a crit for the students and for himself, um, you see something very different going on. So I, I think their clarity was what he was mm -hmm. after, and that would be why he switched to ale popping for ale drinking. Um, Tabernacle. Um, yeah. Tabernacle is a word that doesn't really work so well in, in the mood of the, the old English, but sure. it has, has completely different associations, but different criteria were in his mind. Yeah, no, that's a good point, too. And, and also, I mean, keeping in mind that, like, none of these were finished, <laughs> so who knows what other tinkering he might have done. Um, yeah, it, the, the Beowulf uh, translation and commentary, the, the commentary part, are all like his lecture notes. So it's not they're not even necessarily going along with his translation. There are other notes that Christopher Tolkien pulled out from his lecture notes to kind of play with him. So I he does obviously make those changes in the text like Fain to Tabernacle and that kind of thing. Like those are crossed out in the actual translation. But some of the commentary is written at other times or for other purposes, like you said, for you know, teaching rather than necessarily a general audience. I noticed that Tolkien's translation is water and wild with and flowers instead of with flowers. Well, I think that's what um, yeah. was being said. I thought that was discussing the other end, the water and wild and woods. But this one right, but the, the with and the, the W's with the with yeah. is, is <laughs> would, would make it sound yeah. a little too alliterative, I guess. Uh, like if you want to think of it that way. Right. The water and wild and woods with flowers, just, I mean, we don't, like, some of this is crit ficking, right? Because we don't know why Tolkien necessarily changed this. It's, it's taking, though, the words that he said about translation throughout and trying to apply it to a specific 
sense. Yeah. A question about so um, your Ethiopian example, and I don't remember what the Anglo-Saxon word was, but the other one. Um, is that not sort of a, is, is synonymy not important in languages? Like you to have more than one word for the same thing, so that you could like you have more poetry and stuff. Well, yes, synonyms are important in language. Uh, I agree with that. Um, he's saying it's unusual there. Like, not that it doesn't happen at all or anything. He's saying it's unusual. And for uh, Sigil Warren, particularly, he's saying we, like, it's kind of bizarre because we don't really know what the elements of this mean. And, and that, I mean, that's what his paper explores, is what do the elements of this mean? And he goes on. Um, some people think that that's his like genesis for Balrog too, so it's really interesting if you're interested in Balrogs. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's yeah, synonyms are definitely important, but it's I don't think there he's saying that like this is bad. It's just oh hey, this is unusual. Let's look at it more. Like why is it doing that? But I think as a general principle, he's saying classical and biblical names aren't generally translated because and I mean we can come up with theories about why he might think that. You know, one of the things that I haven't done or haven't been able to do at this point is to go back and look like what are the books that he was reading in school and, and college to see what are what are the instructions he's being given while he's learning about how to translate things and all of that, which I think would be a really interesting second paper to write. <laughs> yes. I noticed that while Tolkien changed classic ill drinking in Beowulf's translation, he left quack in The Hobbit. Yeah, well, I mean he... Last yeah. Dollars, yeah, yeah uh, so um, one of the examples I give in here um, is where he changed Air Was to Had Been, um, which is actually changed back to the system version of um, Sir Orfeo. I mean, he uses Air, you know, E-R-E be before, right, uh, in plenty of places so like why does he why does he not just use that there as well following his own middle english version but he doesn't use air at all in sir orfeo even though he does use it in sir gawain and pearl again like i mean i would have to crit fic to figure out exactly why a little bit why he might do that um i think that if if we're looking at sir orfeo as a translation for a general audience not necessarily a student audience, then that might just be one like, hey, the original has had been, I'm just going to use had been because it's easy and it's simple and everyone knows what it means. Yes. Um, to kind of go back to the and versus with kind of question, in published work, as opposed to stuff that Christopher Tolkien has given us, one factor we have to consider is the proofreaders. I have, I have a good friend who writes speculative fiction for the young adult audience, and she says with every book, she has to go to war with proofreaders to allow her characters to use slang. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's proofreaders clean things up on, on, on authors. Yeah, I, well, I, Christopher Tolkien cleaned up his father's translation there, I think, so. I don't, I don't again, like, I don't, I can't say that that was necessarily an edit because we don't we don't have the at least they've not been published yet and I'm I've not yeah. been to the boat lane to see what notes there might be you know on the translation itself of Sir Orfeo but that's the the version we have anyway yeah, yeah. all right cool. we're out of time you did a great job timing yourself